Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. All right, if we could come to order, please. Um, this is the October 5th, 2029 a.m. meeting of Alamance County Board of Commissioners. Uh, I'm Chair Amy Scott Gailey, and with us today we have Vice Chair Steve Carter, Commissioner Bill Lashley, Commissioner Eddie Boswell, and Commissioner Tim Sutton. So, uh, Commissioner Lashley, if you could please lead us in an invocation and in the Pledge of Allegiance. I'd be glad to. Let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pause at this time to honor you. We honor you because you are worthy of honor. We worship you because you are worthy of worship. We ask you to, to guide our country, keep our, keep our president and, and his staff and all the people in this country safe and secure. We also ask you to, to guide this, this committee, this, these commissioners through this day and as we do the people's business, guide us and direct us in your holy name we pray. Amen. 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 to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, uh, the first item is public speakers who want to be heard on agenda-related items. Uh, today, we don't have an overflow room. The court system is using it as a courtroom, and so we were limited for this meeting because of COVID restrictions to only having email and call-in uh, public speakers. So, Madam Clerk, do we have anybody to call, or do we have any emails on agenda-related items? Not on agenda-related items, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. So, we'll move on to commissioner responses and then approval of the agenda. Motion to approve. Second. Uh, Commissioner Carter has made a motion to approve the agenda, and Commissioner Boswell has seconded it. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Everyone opposed? The next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. Motion to approve. Second. Commissioner Carter has made a motion to uh, approve the consent agenda, and Mr. Lashley, Commissioner Lashley, has uh, seconded it. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, the first item for business is a public, a public hearing to consider uh, amendments to the heavy industrial development ordinance related to the solar energy uh, provision. So, Tanya Cattle, if you would present that, please. Just uh, give us a little sketch about what the public hearing is about. So, this morning's hearing is uh, we're amending the heavy industrial development ordinance since we wrote the solar energy system ordinance uh, about the only piece of the amendment if you look into definitions under a renewable energy facility we're just striking through the word solar everything else will stay the same that's the only amendment we needed to make to make this ordinance work together with solar energy okay does anybody have any questions before uh, we talk about the public hearing so for this public hearing, since we don't have space in the meeting room due to COVID restrictions, um, the presence of the virus in the community, it was uh, people had to either email or call, ask to be called. Do we have anybody related to the public hearing? No, Madam Chair, we received no written comments or requests to be called. Okay, so there's no written uh, comments or requests to be called, just to uh, be sure that we're all do everything that we're supposed to do. I'm going to ask if, wait, did we open it? We have not opened it. I make a motion we go into public. Hearing. Second. Okay, thank you. Mr. Boswell has made a motion that we open the public hearing and Mr. Lashley has seconded it. I got a little ahead of myself. Okay. Um, if there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <coughs> all right, so we don't have anybody who has requested to be called to give a public comment, and we don't have any emails to read. Is there anybody on this side of the room, 
my left, your right, who wants to be heard about the um, amendments to the Heavy Industrial Development Ordinance. Seeing no one, I'm going to turn to this side of the room, my right, your left. Is there anyone who wishes to be heard about the Heavy Industrial Development Ordinance? And seeing no one, uh, do we have a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. Mr. Lashley has made a motion to close the public hearing, and Mr. Carter has seconded it. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, the next item is to review the, uh, the um, heavy industrial development ordinance itself and um, possibly entertain a motion. Okay, so you all have a copy of what is the final version from the planning board. They have already approved uh, one change in the definitions. You also have a copy of the consistency statement for the heavy industrial development ordinance. That is required by law mm -hmm. if there's a motion to be made, if that can be read as well. I'll make a motion we approve. Second. Okay. Um, as part, how should we style that with a consistency statement? Um, Claude, is it okay if they just reference the consistency, or do they need to read the whole statement? You just make the just make the statement and approve it, just so we have something in the record. Okay, I'll read the consistency statement, and um, then maybe if we can amend the motion to include the consistency statement, would that be appropriate. Yes. Okay. So the consistency statement uh, says the Alamance County Board of Commissioners hereby finds that the proposed amendments to the Alamance County Heavy Industrial Development Ordinance are consistent with the Alamance County Land Development Plan as adopted. Specifically, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners finds that the Alamance County Land Development Plan directs the county to promote flexibility in development ordinances to develop conscious strategies for proactively managing the type of growth that is consistent with the county's overall vision and goals. Furthermore, the Board of Commissioners finds that the proposed amendments are necessary to remove ambiguous and conflicting language within the existing ordinance. Therefore, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners recommends approval of the proposed amendments to the Alamance County Heavy Industrial Development Ordinance. So, Mr. Lashley, would you amend your motion to include the consistency yes, statement? Yes, I'll amend my motion. And Mr. Carter, do you second that? I do. All right, so we have a motion and a second to approve the heavy industrial development ordinance with the consistency statement attached. Is there any discussion? I think it's a step in the right direction. And thank you for all the work that you put in there. Absolutely. That was a subcommittee that did a lot of work and staff just kind of went with them through the process. Yes, I echo that. Um, there's been a heck of a lot of work on this heavy industrial development ordinance and the solar energy new ordinance over the last, gosh, year and a half. Right. And um, we just really appreciate all the volunteers and staff who work together to make that possible. Oh, yes, we appreciate everybody volunteers on these boards. All right, so we have a motion and a second. If there's no further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, the next item on the agenda is a proclamation to recognize our Alamance County law enforcement deputies and officers. Um, this was an idea that came up through um, a citizen contacted, I believe, me and Commissioner Boswell with the idea that we do this, and we both thought it was a good one. Um, Commissioner Boswell, would you like to read the proclamation? I'd be happy to. This comes from our board. <coughs> Whereas the citizens of Alamance County believe that all persons are created equal and endowed with the inalienable rights to life and liberty. Whereas a fundamental purpose of government is to secure these inalienable rights. Whereas our law enforcement officers place their lives at risk every day to ensure that these rights are preserved and provide the essential protection that all Americans require to raise their families and lead productive lives. Whereas the relationship between our fellow citizens and law enforcement officers is an important element in their ability to provide that protection by working directly with their communities to help foster a safe environment where we all can prosper. Whereas all Americans <clears throat> are entitled to live with the confidence that law enforcement officers 
and agencies in their communities will live up to our nation's founding principles and will protect the rights of all persons. Whereas the Constitution declares in its preamble that one of its primary purposes was to establish justice. Generations of Americans have marched, fought, bled, and died to safeguard the promise of our founding document and protect our shared inalienable rights. Now therefore, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners do hereby recognize the deputies and police officers serving in Alamance County for their loyal and faithful devotion to the safety and security of our community and encourage all of our citizens and businesses to join with us in showing our support for this proclamation. This the fifth day of October 2020. Great. And just want to tell the ones that are here, thank you. And we also wanted to let the other, I mean, you guys serve right beside them a lot of times on weekends, and they've been right there with you to help preserve the rights of this county and the people to protect us. And I felt patriotic, thought I'd wear my flag this morning. <laughs> because I think that's what the story is. And your cross. And my cross. I, I am like a Christian, that. and I, I believe that we all have the right to proclaim our Christianity. Amen. Thank you. Amen. All right. You know, may I say that in a count on a light notes count, is it Charles Barkley? Charles Barkley said, we're talking about defund the police. He said, who are you going to call? That's it. Who, right. who are you going to call? I'm glad you're there to be called. <laughs> we do. And um, we don't have to vote on this. Uh, it's a proclamation. Uh, I, Madam Clerk, I would ask that this proclamation be circulated to the other county commissions in the state so that they could consider doing the same. They Great idea. Yeah. So, well done. Mm. You know, the head of police officer, Myrtle Beach, killed saw that, sir. this Good past weekend. Worst okay. of calls, domestic violence. A young man. Oh, yeah. Too. Okay. Very sad. We need to vote on that. No, it's a proclamation, so we don't have to vote. All right, the next item on the agenda is the capital project ordinance for the ACC bond project. Uh, Susan Evans, our finance director, is going to present that, and I understand that we have Matt Banks and Tom Hartman can, are joining us by Zoom if there's any information from them that's requested. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Before you this morning is a capital project ordinance that would adopt a budget of $6.2 million for the um, service, Student Services Center, which is part of the $39.6 million bond project. Um, if you'll recall, we have brought before you already the Center of Excellence, and we are bringing these before you as they are ready to start spending money. The um, upfront costs are covered through a reimbursement resolution. What this ordinance will allow us to do is go ahead and amend our budget for the $6.2 million project. And if there are any questions, we'll be glad to answer them at this time. Is there any special language which needs to be included in a motion or read for this one? Sometimes we have no. special stuff to read. No? Okay. Motion go please. I'll second that. Okay, Mr. Carter has made a motion to approve and Mr. Lashley has seconded it. Is there any discussion or questions? Well, we'd like to welcome Tom and Matt for being on the screen with us this morning. <laughs> Thank you guys for what you do. It's been a pleasure for me to work with you on some of this, these projects. Moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, if there's no more discussion, then, because um, we have a motion by Mr. Carter and a second by Mr. Lashley, if there's no more discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. you. All right, next item on the agenda is a Board of Health appointment for the pharmacist slot. Um, Alex Rimmer is our interim public health director.
Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Good morning. So we had two applicants for the pharmacist position um, and the Board of Health met, met with both of them and would like to provide a recommendation um, for Dr. Riley Caldwell for our pharmacist position. <coughs> Well, she do one associated with Duke. Or is that the old one? Um, I'm not sure. It looks like I've got uh, the applications here, and it looks like she is the one. Okay. Uh, she's got a Duke.edu email address. Yes, she works for Duke Home Care and Hospice. Yeah, she's actively practicing pharmacy right now. I, don't, I believe the other one wasn't. Yeah, that's good. Uh, Mr. Carter, did you make a motion to? I did. Second. Okay, Mr. Carter has made a motion to approve the appointment of Anne Marie Riley Caldwell to the Alamance County Board of Health, and Mr. Boswell has seconded it. Um, before I call for the vote, I just note that I understand that the candidates are on phone standby. That's so correct. if somebody had a question for them. I apologize. Hey, right now. Uh, <laughs> I thought I had that sucker off. <laughs> so if anybody had a question for him, we could call them. Mr. Sutton, can call them No. All we'll right. Tory up there. If there's no questions or discussion, then all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Haygood, do you have a presentation about demolishing uh, some kind of county-owned property? I do. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Going to run through a quick presentation. My request this morning is for permission from the commissioners to demolish a piece of county-owned property uh, located right here on uh, Elm Street, the former CSI building. Uh, at one point, I believe it was also the Board of Elections office uh, a number of years ago. Uh, our records indicate the building was constructed in 1948, a little over 2,000 square feet. It's currently unoccupied. Its last uh, tenant was CSI with the Sheriff's Department. We have relocated those folks uh, from that building. Uh, the building's in, we have it rated as a grade D building. Uh, it needs approximately $40,000 for roof replacement. That's when we really started thinking about relocating people out of this building. Plus. Once we finished our facility plan, it was demonstrated that the building sits in a prime building spot uh, for the future addition to the court. So we'd like to go ahead and demolish this building to make way for the new court office building that is our long-term plan. We have a quote from D.H. Griffith uh, to demolish the building and abate any uh, uh, toxic sort of, uh, materials that are found for $20,546. We have uh, adequate funds in the county's capital reserve to pay for that. If the board approves this action today, uh, DH will start uh, later this month and we'll have that building removed very, very quickly. We're, we're thinking sometime in uh, November. And just to let the commissioners know, we do plan to start a court office building discussion in January. That will be with the judges, district attorney, the court, start talking about what would that look like? Uh, how would it function? And uh, in our current capital plan, we have scheduled debt issuance and construction for that uh, building to be uh, starting in March of 22. We have all the funds there to do it, the debt capacity to do it. So this would be starting on the road toward uh, building out the section of property that the county owns here in Graham. As you, if you remember from our facility plan, uh, you know, there's a, the lot across the street that includes the current jail and the courthouses. Where you see the office addition in the upper right hand um, in, in yellow, that's where CSI sits now. That's where we believe the new court office building would be would be placed. What that will do is allow us to move everybody that's uh, in courtroom space out of the J.B. Allen building into the new court uh, office addition, and we would relocate all of court from civil down to J.B. Allen. Be very efficient. The county government will eventually take over the civil court building and put county government in both of these two spaces, which would be ideal. And you can see here the, the yellow gold building in the front, that's where CSI sits now beside J.B. Allen. Uh, and again, the, the long range plan is to, to construct this courthouse office uh, annex. So at this time, I'd like to ask the commissioners to uh, approve the demolition of this property and we'll proceed uh, using D.H. Griffin. Motion to approve. 
Did, did you have bids on that time? We did not. Uh, we've worked with our purchaser and we've used DH Griffin. They have consistently been the low bid. On, we, we've done numerous demo projects over the past two years. They have consistently been low bidder and have always done an excellent job. So our purchasing department felt like with the scope of this and the price, we were okay to just go with DH uh, as a sole bidder. So I think they are a master of demolition. Absolutely. People. <laughs> Absolutely. Without a doubt. Okay. okay, Mr. Carter has made a motion to approve and Mr. Lashley has seconded it. Is there any more discussion or questions? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you. All right, got a revenue and recommended expenditure update. Indeed, uh, commissioners, I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about how things are with our major revenue sources in fiscal year 2021, as well as make uh, some recommendations about what we think we can, uh, what action we think we can take based on what I will, I want to make sure it's very clear to the commissioners that this is a very early look at revenues. We're only two months in as far as sales tax goes uh, to fiscal year 2021, but as you'll see, I hope uh, sales tax is coming in very well. and We think we can take a few of the actions that we had planned earlier in the budget. Commissioners will remember the, one of the main features of this budget was uncertainty due to COVID, the impact it's had on our uh, economy. And we projected that to have a very large uh, impact on our sales tax revenue. In fact, we, we have projected a 20% decline in sales tax revenue from 1920 based on uh, discussions from around the state and just not knowing what COVID would actually do to us. Uh, we adopted a budget for this fiscal year that included funds in budgets, but frozen, right? So uh, what I'm gonna talk to you about today that I'm gonna recommend that we do, the money is in the budget to do, but we've been waiting to see are we gonna be okay financially from a revenue perspective. We also had a list of budget reductions that we did not put any money in the budget for, uh, that we talked about at budget time. I'm gonna show those again to you, uh, but they would actually require new revenue. Uh, so we've analyzed our four major revenue sources. I'm going to briefly go over those four, kind of tell you how each one of them are doing. I've looked at all this information. I'm gonna recommend three expenditures that we fall uh, effective October 1st. That means that we pull the trigger on. And then we've created a list of January falls for the board to consider that we'll revisit a little bit later on in the year. So. Seem to be not advancing. There we go. So, just a reminder to the commissioners and the listening public: we have four major revenue sources for county government. Property tax makes up about 60% of our revenue. It's the big one. Sales tax at 15%. Intergovernmental restricted funds; those are mostly state and federal revenues that come to health and DSS that have specific purposes. But it makes up 14% of our revenue. And the final largest category is sales and services. These are things like ambulance fees. Uh, inspections, permits, those those kind of things that the public pays us to do above and beyond the property tax or sales tax that they pay. So we've looked at the four big revenue um, categories. And I'm going to uh, give you a little bit more information about them. If you'll recall, for property tax, we budgeted for fiscal year 2021 almost two and a half million dollars in increase. We were continuing to grow, <coughs> continuing to develop our tax base. That is all good news. Sales tax makes up 15% of our total revenue, and this is where we projected the large hit, seven, a little over $7 million decrease from fiscal year 1920. Restricted intergovernmental, our state federal dollars, we thought, we were projecting that we would get in a, almost uh, 1.6, a little over $1.6 million increase. And that has to do, we believe, with uh, the fact that oftentimes when you get into an economic downturn, you get additional state and federal dollars to try to help help the DSS with the missions that, they, uh, that they're attempting to provide. And for our sales and service revenue, we had projected an almost half a million dollar increase for fiscal year 2021 above the previous year. So how's property tax doing? We, bu we budgeted two and a half million dollars worth of increase for the first quarter as of uh, September 30th. We've collected almost 60% of that. Jeremy's folks do a fantastic job. That's a little better than our collection rate last year. I think last year we were at like 59.4, so Jeremy's mm -hmm. folks are doing awesome, great work. That's almost $60 million that we've collected. At this point, we have collected almost $1.7 million more in revenue than we had in 1920, which is great because we projected a $2.5 million increase. So 
property tax is doing well. It's early. There's still a lot of money left. There's almost $40 million worth of property tax revenue left to collect. But right now, we're on target. We're even getting our increase that we projected. So property tax as a revenue source is doing very well. That's good news. That's 75, um, excuse me, 60% of our revenue right there. Sales tax, we projected a 20% decrease from last fiscal year. The COVID months, which we're counting as March through um, July, that's the revenue that we've actually received. We have not received August or September yet. Um, we're seeing a 2.6% increase above 1920, which is amazing. That is really uh, amazing. We budgeted a 20% decrease from 1920, and our actuals are showing a 2.6% increase. For June and July, which are the two months that we have received sales tax revenue for that actually count toward this fiscal year, we're at 11.64% higher than last June and July, which is phenomenal. It's an additional $635,000 over what we collected in June and July of 2019. So, and I'll show you this in a moment. We look, we're, sales tax revenue does this throughout the course of the year. You, know, you get close to Christmas, it's way up. After Christmas, phew, take, everybody takes a break, and then it goes back up and down. So we tried to look at what would happen if you, if you just flatline sales tax revenue, what dollar amount, if you brought in the same dollar amount every month, uh, you know, how would that look? Currently with June and July's revenues, we're almost $2 million above that average revenue. So that is excellent. Th this are, these are all amazing uh, early numbers, but I would feel comfortable telling the commissioners that we are trending very well. This slide will, tell, will show you how revenues have come in for sales tax over the, each month uh, that COVID has been, uh, has been with us. This shows you that in June, uh, we had a significant uh, amount of sales tax revenue that came in. We were almost 17.5% higher than June of 19. And for July, the last month of sales tax revenue that we've received from the state, we were at almost 6% higher. So that's, that's very, very good, very strong numbers. Um, and this, this slide just demonstrates the same, the same information with, with dollars put to it. Uh, where, where that one month budget, if we received, if we flatlined, we should receive a little over $2 million every month if we want to stay on target. In June, we were at $3.2 million. In July, we were at two point eight. million. So we're, we're really significantly uh, higher than our projections. This, this final slide about sales tax shows you what's going on. That, there's two lines above the, above the flat line. One is the green one is 2018 sales tax actuals. The purple line is uh, 1920 sales tax actuals. That flat red orangey line, that's average for this fiscal year. As long as we stay above that line every month, or even if we dip below it, as long as on average we stay, we're gonna meet budget. The two blue bar graphs are our actuals for July and August. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing to see that we're not only far above what we budgeted, right now we're significantly above uh, 1920. So all this to say, I believe sales tax revenue, it's early, but it is coming in very strong. Uh, it leads me to believe that uh, we, we can do a few things, uh, but limited because it's so early. Intergovernmental revenue, this is our state and federal dollars. We budgeted 1.6 uh, million. As of September 30th, our collection on these funds is down 2.3%. We're about $150,000 from where we would like to be in state and federal dollars. We believe these slowdowns in payments are COVID related. The health department and DSS believe that they've indicated to their boards that they believe these funds will come in, that state's dealing with COVID just like the rest of us. So some of these funds are coming in slowly. But this is a revenue source that I believe we need to continue to watch. Uh, you know, some of these funds are helping with employee salaries, so we want to keep an eye on this. So uh, property tax revenue coming in right on target. Sales tax performing incredibly for as early as we are at 75% of our revenue. Intergovernmental, this does not concern me yet, but it does bear watching. And our sales and service, our final big, big revenue source, we budgeted an increase of almost half a million dollars. As of September 30th, we are down significantly, 331,000 uh, to where we thought we would be with this budget year. We're seeing that primarily in ambulance fees. Our ambulance fees are down. We believe this is COVID related. If you'll, I'm sure you've been following the hospitals there for quite some time, not as many folks were going to the hospital. They just didn't want to go. We're not transporting as many folks uh, as we have in the past. 
could be COVID related, we believe, or reluctance to call 911 unless you absolutely have to go. We're seeing, uh, we've seen declines in dental revenues. I believe the dental uh, clinic was open for emergencies only during the height of COVID. So we've seen some declines there. And then of course our parks and library and passport services have fallen off significantly. So our program revenue that usually comes in through those sources uh, has, has uh, been shut down or temporarily halted due to COVID. This is another concern, but uh, something that I believe we will need to continue to watch. All this to say, because of the strength of property tax and it's coming in as targeted, including our projected increase, and the, the outstanding performance early of sales tax revenue, I believe these revenues are need to be watched, but are being outweighed by particularly sales tax right now. So. There, are, there were some mid-year considerations that we talked about as we went through our uh, budget process this year. These are all considerations that the funding is in the budget to do, right? The funds are in the budget. There's, uh, the budget is balanced, including taking these actions, but we did not pull the trigger until we had an idea of how would revenue actually perform. We had uh, uh, a compensation plan that had been submitted by the sheriff's office. It was contingent on sales tax revenue, and the sheriff had to work inside to work positions, freeze positions to make this money happen, uh, which they have done. Uh, the Department of Social Services, uh, we're working with DSS on a compensation program, but it's a very similar situation to the sheriff. Uh, it was based on sales tax revenue coming in and they uh, making sure that there's available salary for any comp program. EMS and CECOM fluctuating work weeks, both, uh, we were trying to get rid of fluctuating work week for EMS and CECOM. Uh, this is a, it's been in place for 20 years detrimental to the department, very confusing to the employees, <coughs> will increase their pay when it's enacted, uh, but it's contingent on sales tax, the department revenues, and is not budgeted to begin until January 1. So at this time, it's not scheduled to begin. We will be looking at it in January. Our health nurses, we budgeted uh, a compensation program for health nurses. Uh, that Those funds are in the health department budget, ready to go. Uh, we were watching sales tax. The dental clinic, very similar. The dental clinic's funding is completely its own, separate from county government. Those funds come entirely from dental clinic programs. Uh, we were watching the dental clinic's revenue stability. And the final budgeted mid-year consideration is ABSS capital improvement. Uh, we have portions of sales tax that are required by law that must be given to the school system. So we budgeted 1.2 million for PAYGO for ABSS this year. We budgeted another 1.5 million, but we kept that in a transfer account because we did not know what sales tax would actually do. And if we had budgeted it as pay-go and the bottom fell out of the economy, by law we'd be on the hook to have to pay it, even with our own money. So we, we were a little conservative. The funding is there for another 1.5 million for ABSF. So these are the three actions that I feel comfortable recommending to the commissioners take. At this point, based on uh, sales, excuse me, property tax doing so well, sales tax coming in way above uh, where we thought it would be, and some level of concern about intergovernmental revenue and um, sales and service revenue. Those two revenues are concerning, but I think property tax and sales tax uh, could carry the day on these three actions. So I'm recommending that the commissioners consider approving and letting uh, the Sheriff's Department proceed with its compensation program the details of this program are as such, uh, it would be effective October 1st. The cost for the rest of the fiscal year to implement this would be a little over $167,000. Sheriff's Department staff have indicated uh, 92 employees that are all corporal and above and under median uh, salary range that would be eligible for this uh, raise. They would, the raise would be $2,000 each. That comes out to be roughly three to 5% uh, depending on the employee salary. It does require a budget amendment the sheriff's staff have been working to freeze positions to make this happen. Some of that has been in detention. So if the commissioners want to do this, it will take an extra action, but I'll go over at the very end, but it'll take a budget amendment to move some funds over to patrol uh, to make this actually happen. Second uh, action that I feel comfortable recommending to the commissioners is uh, to proceed with the health nurse compensation program. As you know, our health nurses have been working uh, around the clock uh, at just yeoman's work. I, I can't even uh, uh, really adequately explain the job that they've been doing too. Uh, if the commissioners approve this, their uh, raises would go into effect October 1st and would cost 71, almost $72,000 for the rest of the year. This affects 22 different employees, 
uh, all across the spectrum of public health nurse uh, employees that we have, and the salaries raises range from 4.5% to 9%, depending on the uh, employee and their current pay. And the final recommendation that I would make to the commissioners at this point is to increase ABSS's CIP. This is their money. It, kind of, it came in with all the additional um, sales tax, so it, it needs to go to them. I would suggest we go ahead and do that now. Uh, we would increase their PAYGO uh, budget by $375,000. That's a quarter of uh, what we extra that we budgeted for them but didn't give them. It does require a budget amendment but no new money. That, but the money is in our budget, just not in their PAYGO account. And what I would suggest we do is we send ABSS a check for that dollar amount, $375,000. Uh, I believe they would put that into uh, security vestibules and other things at uh, some of the middle schools that they've been working on, but we would continue to send them the one twelfth of the original budget uh, until next time. So, um, so three actions: sheriff's office raises, health nurse raises, and increase the funding for uh, capital for ABSS. Then I believe in January we need to return and see how revenues have panned out as our sales tax stayed. Uh, as strong as it is currently, have our other two revenues begun to perform the way that we hope they will? If so, I believe that these programs and actions would be appropriate to take. Uh, we'll be working with DSS to formulate a compensation program for them, similar to what we are uh, proposing for the sheriff that we would bring to the commissioners in January. Also, uh, the funding would be, uh, is planned to start for EMS and CECOM for uh, removing their fluctuating work week in January. I think that would be a reasonable consideration. The dental compensation plan for the dental employees, uh, we would be discussing that in January, as well as uh, any additional funding for ABSS capital improvement that they might raise at that point. And then uh, these are the lists of actions that, and items that we cut from the current fiscal year budget. There is no money in the budget to do any of these things. These other considerations, the money is there. These, these items, the, there is no money. The board would have to approve uh, new money. And I don't feel like we're quite there yet. I think we're, we're close, but we're, we're not quite to a point where I feel like uh, it would be prudent to actually say we're going to up our revenue budget to implement some of these items. You can see them here. Uh, they range from uh, merit, play, merit pay for all employees to additional um, education operational funds for ABSS. If property tax and sales tax continue on this track and our sales and service revenue comes back, I'm not quite as concerned about intergovernmental uh, because we've, we've received a tremendous amount of grant funding that uh, I think could help us in the intergovernmental. A little, I'm a little concerned about sales tax. Hopefully it will continue. Uh, we won't see a dip uh, uh, as people start to get into the new flu season. And I'm certainly hopeful that uh, the feds will be able to do a new stimulus uh, because some of, uh, there's been some talk that our sales tax, that has helped keep our sales tax high, is that we've had some uh, good assistance from the federal government uh, with people that are out of work. But I believe these are all items that uh, could be discussed a little bit further into the fiscal year, but may not be the uh, best idea at this time. So in summary, I recommend that the commissioners uh, consider and approve the Sheriff's Office and the Health Nurse Compensation Plan. It would take a budget amendment to do so in the amount of $104,000. We would move from detention uh, to the Sheriff's Office budget to enact that plan. And then we would uh, ask the, sher uh, the commissioners to approve a budget amendment in the amount of $375,000 to uh, transfer money from our capital reserve over to ABSS PAYGO. So um, I'm coming to you a little bit earlier than I had thought. I originally planned to come in January, mid-year, but sales tax is really, really strong. And I believe uh, you've heard from the sheriff's office about the importance of uh, trying to keep them in a position where they can recruit and retain uh, uh, good employees. And we've all seen the good work from our health nurses and have a true appreciation for the job that they do especially in this in this COVID environment that is not to downplay all the other actions they're all needed and important some are not budgeted to actually start until mid-year anyway this is a little early but i feel like um, these are these are reasonable actions to take so i'll certainly try to answer any questions if the commissioners are interested in moving forward these would be the actions that would uh, i would suggest should be taken before we open it up to questions, if I could just uh, take a minute to frame up uh, whatever motions might be considered so commissioners could think about that during the course of the discussion. So we could, uh, I don't know if we want to scroll back to the other slide where you had the um, information about the three different 
things. Um, yeah, that. So commissioners could choose one, two, or all three of these options, or we could decide not to do anything today and to think about it. And I wanted to be sure, you know, in June we have to have a public hearing to adopt the budget, but there's no public hearing required for uh, budget amendments and to sort of shift the shift the I don't know stuff around. That's right. correct. But, uh, these funds, the funds for all three of these are in the approved budget. We just have not pulled the trigger watching the revenues to make sure we would be on target. But that, that is correct. The, and the commissioners can do any of these, none of these, uh, or any of these other items. It, it is within the commissioner's purview to, to create new revenue to do these other things too. But, uh, so we could also wait and um, give an opportunity for the public to comment if we wanted. Absolutely. And bring this back on the agenda for the next meeting. If I'll, we, I'll make that motion that we table it to the next meeting and give the people, the people that pay the taxes the right to hear what's going on a big part of it. I will second that, Bill. And before we vote, I'd like for some explanation as to why you've got the uh, CIP for the schools when they're getting you know, $150 million. Uh, you know, that just does uh, I know you said it's in the plan. Yes. But it just smacks of... Uh, Accountability, an accountability situation. Just you're getting 150 million dollars. I mean, I know everybody's gonna say, "Well, that's not enough to cover everything." Um, with that said, maybe we can get some commentary on them if you don't mind. Certainly. So now, then. let me say this: uh, uh, you're on a wing and a prayer, if that's the right phrase. That, 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 <laughs> yeah, you, we're on a wing and a prayer. We're not even through the first quarter yet, and on the horizon where things might look good now, I mean, I'm not so sure it's going to improve. Uh, to, to, in my opinion, to facilitate the continuation, you got to have a continuation, and it's good news. And, and I'm not sure, we're not even through the first quarter yet, and I'm not sure that the next three quarters, uh, with all this happening, uh, is, is going to... I think the election's going to make a big decision yeah, yeah, I do too. of money coming in. But I, anyway. I'm really concerned. I agree with you, Tim. I mean, no offense, it just seems like we get money, we spend it. And obviously, a lot of us are leaving this board, and but uh, there's going to be uh, quite a philosophy uh, to to address after December's meeting and so forth and so on. I just I just don't have a mindset of if we get it, spend it. I've never had it, never had it. And, uh, and I'm not against the salaries. Uh, yeah, my, my main question is the schools. <clears throat> so with ABSS. Uh, we have, we have indicated the school system that yes, we have funded their uh, bond program, and we've told them that they should be able to plan for $3.3 million every year. Uh, we were trying to shoot for the next seven years in CIP money. This year we approved 1.2 million instead of the 3.3 because we didn't know what sales tax was gonna do. So the school system by law will receive uh, at some point during the fiscal year, if we get in additional sales tax, they will get the articles that are due to them. So uh, at this point, to me, it seems prudent to go ahead and give them $375,000 since we've seen a significant increase in sales tax. Some of that money is theirs. We have to give it to them at some point. We could wait till the end of the year, but they will get any of that additional money or you can give it to them now so they can spend now. So. I don't think they, if they're not going to have public school and it's not going to be open, why in the hell are we funding them? <laughs> that don't make sense to me. You know, if they've had a choice to let the let the children go to school, and they're doing it over over the internet, and everybody's failing. You know, you don't you don't reward failure, and that's what that's what what this does, in my opinion. Well, I, I agree with Bill on the fact that we do need to wait. We need the public to weigh in on this, to look at it, and have a chance to give us their two cents. The schools surely don't have much to, to uh, give any confidence of, their, of uh, what they're doing. 
you know, if failure, you don't honor failure, you don't reward failure. And that's what we would put, be doing. Somewhat in their defense, they're doing what the governor tells them. That's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, um, so we have a motion by Mr. Lashley to table uh, until, I guess, the next meeting? Yes. And a second by Mr. Boswell. Um, I'll say that uh, I think that there's been a lot of work between county government, um, especially Andrea Rollins and uh, Mr. Haygood and um, Todd Thorpe and Jeremy Teeter and our finance director and um, Mr. Benson, the, or Dr. Benson, the superintendent, to really work together on the capital improvement plan, the CIP plan, and I think that um, the list of projects is good and needed, and hopefully someday these poor sweet children will be going back to school. I hope Amen so. that. And we would really like for ABSS, we hope that they're taking advantage of the time without the children in school to get some of their work done. They sure ought to have a lot of money because they today. Sure, they're not spending any. Well, one would hope, um, but they don't have this three hundred seventy-five thousand dollars that uh, belongs to them. So, anyway, those are just I do have a question I'd like to ask. Um, we have our health health department director and our sheriff here both, and I'm wondering, are y'all? I'll direct it to each of you individually. Alex, are we? Are y'all dealing with any uh, problems with retention, employee retention during this period of time? With getting contract nurses for our case investigation um, and things like that and obviously we have a lot of employees working 60 70 hours a week right now um, to be able to do that case investigation so they, they definitely are feeling the breath of the load with COVID. Hi, Brian is there coronavirus money available to help supplement that or is that uh, there is you know we've done a one round of hazard pay one-time bonus uh, we're planning to do that again before December 30th so there will be a bonus but before COVID one of our biggest turnover areas was uh, health nurses it was really difficult and you know, we're competing for nurses with the regular medical profession so uh, what we had seen was it was difficult to recruit and then to retain them in general so this this plan had been talked about uh, probably for the past two years this is the first budget year before COVID that we felt like we could actually try to do it you know this is beyond merit pay this is really very targeted increases trying to bring these positions up to closer to market to try to keep them here. I think that's kind of similar with the sheriff's department. I think you know, the sheriff spent some time kind of talking with you all about the difficulties that he faces. We had planned this year before COVID to do targeted raises for the sheriff's department anyway, because they do have some of the highest turnover in patrol and in detention. So, you know, COVID's kind of thrown everything into uh, kind of a strange place. So. I have the same question for the sheriff about where we are. With well, in the last year, we have lost uh, or losing and have lost 10 employees with well over 200 years of experience. And you don't replace that. And a lot of them's uh, statement to me, why should I stay any longer? We're getting no raises to help my retirement. And uh, it's put us, you know, in a pretty bad position in a way, and I'm not... Uh, trying to go against what the commissioner wants to do. And uh, that makes it pretty difficult because when you have new staff coming in, lost that many years of experience, you're going to have lawsuits, you're going to have different things happen. It's going to be costly to us. And I'm, I feel sure we're going to lose more. Well, my thoughts on this is let's, let's take it to the next meeting. And if we have to vote on them individually, I, don't, I guess we can do that. Certainly. Yes, so uh, that way we can pick what we, we want to do. We also, Eddie, we froze 15 positions to have money to hopefully do something. Right. Yeah, I'm and not if we're against not going it. To get it's the just rate, then I wouldn't like to go and fill those 15 positions. Yeah. Can you wait two weeks? For you, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, we have a motion to table by Mr. Lashley and a second by Mr. Boswell. Is there any more discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. Uh, aye. aye. Anyone opposed? Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we have a presentation about the availability of high-speed broadband internet in Alamance County. 
<coughs> Bruce Walker. This is, as he gets ready, this is a topic that uh, is very much on people's minds with the virus and teleworking and people having schooling from home. So, could you get some more information about that? No, so really, since the last time we talked about all the different things we're doing at the county and the community is reaching out to see if churches and folks are um, offering up their Wi-Fi. And of course, in that time period, uh, the great grant loosened some of its restrictions. Uh, federal uh, government passed through to the uh, state. So we had until October 14th to see if we could find some partners. We partnered with PPRC to see who would be willing We've had a lot of meetings with different folks. Um, in the middle of all that, the state said, wait, you know, there was a, across the list service, and wait a minute, it's not, you know, free for all on the money. There are restrictions on restrictions and asterisks and those kind of things. So they said uh, areas that have 50% uh, or less on the internet access, uh, let me pull up this part right here, uh, 25 megabytes download, 3 megabytes upload, which is very, very slow has to be 50% or more. So that restricted us even more so. We do have some areas that are in the light orange and the light tan. I mean, the medium orange to the darker color are those areas in the northern part. These are, uh, when we did our survey, these are the same areas that we saw on our personal survey that we did. The state survey is up there as well. Um, and so some of those areas have indicated through the state and through the federal government that those are areas that qualify. We reached out to a bunch of folks. We talked to the state to confirm this because it's kind of, again, go figure some ambiguous language in the, uh, the, the uh, releasing of funds. And so uh, we had a couple of meetings. We talked to the state uh, folks on this uh, with uh, Jesse to help us out. So again, we did find some partners that are interested in doing this. And we also found that come January 1st, if everything goes according to plan, they're going to continue with these loosening restrictions. So what we found is we had a lot of folks that we talked to. You know, there's needless to say, if you have folks adjacent spilling into other counties and they have the pipes, let's call them pipes, mm -hmm. the connectivity, they may want to extend it into our county and those kinds of things. And so we found some partners that are interested and we found some folks that may want a new competition come to our area. Um, but they all said, you know what, this was a surprise to us as well. We don't have enough time to do the uh, formal process, which would be how, you know, the cost effectiveness and those kind of, how many people could we serve and that kind of stuff. We've offered up our maps and our folks to, to help with that because we have a really good GIS department. So the bad news is we don't have anybody willing to partner with us by the October 14th. The good news is we have folks because according to the state they're going to continue with these loosened restrictions to get more people on board in January 1st um, with the new funds released we have folks that we're willing they're willing to talk to us and talk about a plan and come back to this board saying this is what we're thinking about in certain these certain areas so we've as of right now we have three to four uh, uh, companies that are interested in talking to us that didn't know we were interested and so we're going to continue forward with that and see where we go. Um, this, you know, getting back to everything, all this stuff takes an enormous amount of money. Uh, this, the great grant gives 50% toward the project, and then the the provider can do the other 50%, or they can negotiate with the county to help fund that. And uh, we, so that would be proposals that they would come back to us with in those identifying areas. Our GIS department has looked at how many school kids are in these areas, and so we're, we're offering up, luckily we have this kind of information to share with these <coughs> private companies to say these are the potential customers you have, and do your analytics, and you know, they're a private company, so they have to figure out how they're gonna make money. You know, is this a worthy investment? But you know, obviously with the grant, it makes it a little bit easier, a little bit closer to that. So that's kind of where we're at a couple, two weeks later. So. Uh, like I said, the bad news, we have nobody willing to jump in and kind of do something haphazard in the time for this emergency October 14th deadline. The good news is they're going to continue this forward, and we've got three or four partners to talk to to organize and get it straight and come back with a proposal 
you know, sometime after January. Is it? Is the map indicating that all the areas that are in white with uh, no shading at all, does that mean that those areas are supposed to be getting acceptable broadband service? According to the federal and state government, of course, they put out a survey, which is on our website as well. We did a survey two years ago. We had less than 1% of people respond. Now the state has a survey, which if you log in, um, It'll kind of like a speed test. If you've done a speed test on your computer, it'll log in and immediately identify how fast or slow you are at that moment and send it to the state. And so they recognize the same thing we recognized a couple of years ago, is that what the map's saying, what people say, isn't exactly what's on the ground. So everybody's trying to work better to really fine tune where people don't have good access. So what you see in white is slight, you know, according to the state and federal government, slightly better than that minimum requirement. It doesn't mean they're fantastic. Believe you me, I get phone calls and emails. Some of the people on, uh, in, on the board here have let me know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we don't have good access, and I don't have good access. So, um, uh, but in, in relation to all the possibilities, whether it's MiFi, cellular, whatever, these are the folks that are really limited. Um, and so, again, if you're doing an online survey and you don't have access to I, I internet, agree. that kind of limits. <laughs> kind of hard to get that I agree. response. I, I, get. Irony is definitely there. Uh, <laughs> you know, that's why we did one separate that people could send in on paper as well. Um, how did we? How did we notify them that that was available? Well, uh, you, two years ago we sent it out in their tax bill. Okay. okay. And um, was a little. You know, we also uh, asked the school system participate with the students stuff like that again i'll be honest i was a little disappointed in the amount of people that responded um knowing that i get all these phone calls that was pre-covid right? pre-covid because that we, we were recognizing this then. problem <laughs> you know before right um and uh so but the cop that survey's still out there and they can log in wherever they can log in and, and let us know what it is so can they go on the county's web yes. and pick it up where is that okay no, uh, i'll show you Nice. Right. So under e-services, it's also on our splash page, this page right here that constantly changes. It's one of the pages about internet access and uh, internet <coughs> access information. We've got the state survey up here, and then we've got our survey down here that anybody can fill out. So they can go the down answers. on that page to that tab, and they can go down to That's that correct. and punch it in. That's correct. And you know, Good from time to time, both of these papers have advertised that for us, which has been great. You know, we want more people to let us know. This helps us in, let the fed, you know, the federal government, you know, they're doing the census right now. By the way, fill out your census. They've, They've extended that process forward so we get funding. Um, Can you go down on that page again? Yes, sir. There was a map down lower that had a lot more shaded areas in it. Is that? This was our our our, our survey that we did, um, and it indicated kind of the areas that that were um, again from that survey from one percent. We tried to make it, you know, instead of little dots, we tried to, uh, you know, extend it. There's a little disclaimer in there because, again, when you get 1% response, that's not perfect. Um, yeah. When you do a survey, you want at least 6%. Uh, and so, um, but we did map it with a disclaimer. And, of course, as we get the survey adjusted, we adjust this map. Now those, this those in mean? that case, that map's indicating they, they're receiving service. Yes. The people that... Said, said they had certain services in those areas. Obviously, along I-40, um, there's a section up here that AT&T has uh, has expanded. Um, what do you call it? Omniverse. That Uverse. Yeah, Uverse and that kind of thing. That's been in a few areas. Supposedly, they're, they're anticipating. Now, we called some of the big boys on this uh, conversation and said, "We've got big plans, but we can't tell you what it is, and we're not really interested in this, you know the funding. <laughs> but we'll let you know when it's time." Um, so again, we reached out even during this period to see if they would be willing to work with us. Again, money's money. You know, even if it extends a little bit, we want to try to entice these private companies to take advantage of the situation and just service a few more folks. Um, uh, I saw a new cable being put in on the 
Alpha Hall Union Ridge Road. So they're going to get Amy something out there real soon. I hear it coming. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> well, in that area, again, they're expanding. They are expanding that process. So, but they won't tell us or share their maps or tell us, you know, the timing. I, I, I was be... just kidding about going to Amy's house. <laughs> they don't buy that. You just torn it. <laughs> <laughs> it was cool. That's neat. Yeah, so I mean, I was down in the southern part of the county and I was calling Spectrum every month and they said, We're never coming to your neighborhood. Right. As soon as I got ATT, I kind of knocked the door. Uh -huh. Spectrum, we're here That's for the you. Way it goes. You know, so uh, sitting there, done that, done the satellite thing. Um, I, you know, like I said, you guys forward me all the folks that help them the best they can. People are taking advantage of the school's my fives they're giving out, taking advantage of the uh, libraries. It's piecemeal. It's not perfect. We, we, I think we've helped some folks uh, with all the resources and grants that we've been able to get. Hopefully we can get on board and get some competition. Because usually competition wakes up, Spurs. you know, yeah. we're America, mm -hmm. so competition gets everybody interested. So hopefully we get a partner, you know, after January that want to take advantage of this funding. Could you go back to the, to the map? Which one? The first one that you had. Yeah, that yeah. one right there, yeah. And scroll up. To the top, yeah. So um, you mentioned the schools, MiFi's that they're handing out. I happen to have personal knowledge that the MiFi's don't work in that north central part of the county. Um, not only in my household, but other people that I've talked to in the community. Um, you know, the school system gives them out, you take them home, and they don't work because of whatever quirk with your geography, where the satellite is. Yeah, it's behind that mountain over there, and so it blocks some of that um, cellular power. And that's extremely frustrating because, you know, they take your children out of the school, they say, okay, now you're going to do your school at home, and, okay, but we're going to give you this device that doesn't work at your house, and then, okay, so you got to have to travel to somewhere else to do your children's schoolwork. But then the parent has to work. They can't take their children to do the work at <laughs> another place and go to work themselves or take them to, you know, maybe the grandparents live in that zone and can't leave the children at the grandparents' house where they would be supervised because the internet doesn't work there. And um, it just it creates a lot of problems for people in the rural parts of the county because not only do you have your internet problem, but you also have your transportation problem with trying to be three places at one time. And, and a lot of people are working from home. That's that has changed tremendously. That's right. Thank you for pointing that out. And a lot of people are trying very hard to do their work at home. And um, if you do have like a hot spot that, that your family gets instead of trying to use the schools when so your children are trying to do their school work, mom and dad are trying to do their um, occupational work, it's been a nightmare yeah. for a lot of people. Well, those hot spots probably also limit the number of devices that can actually get any kind of download speed on them at one time. Right, they get crowded and slow. So, um, yeah, I just want to point that out because you mentioned the school system has the MiFi's, but they don't work for a lot of people. So it's really disappointing. And we have my grandson at home, and he. Uh, Three days a week, he's online at home. There, you'll see the other kids locking up. We have high, fortunately, have high speed. No, no real good in, uh, cell phone service right off the interstate um, at Alamance Road. But uh, good, fast Wi-Fi, and even watching that, we're watching other other kids lock up. And the teachers even locking up. That's why they got to get them back in the schoolhouse. <laughs> And not only is access a barrier, but also costs. There are families that don't have the money to spend for a monthly um, internet bill, mm -hmm. too. So that's also an important issue. Thank you, Bruce. Good, yeah, good thank report. you for that. Um, good report. Now, do you gentlemen want to proceed forward through the budget amendments, or does anybody want to recess at this time? Looks like a good idea. Which one? A, a, a recess. A recess? All right. We'll have a 10-minute yeah. recess then. Thank you. The next item, or not, excuse me, the next items are budget amendments 
And the first one on deck is from the sheriff's office. Commissioner, I'm here before we today. We have met with RHA, which provides the mental health services uh, for the county, and they are wanting us to provide uh, 40 hours of security, eight to five, at their facility because of, of the mental health people being brought in. Some have a violent. Uh, they've agreed to pay the officer salary and a little bit more for uniforms and stuff. Uh, for 40 hours a week, and that calls for a, a creation of a position in the sheriff's office, and certainly it's up to y'all on that. But they have asked us to do that, and their that position will require $67,500. And where are they going. located? Do you want to? Where are they located? Off of uh, Aunt Elizabeth Drive, on yes. the Holly Hill Mall. That's it, Holly Hill Mall. <laughs> yeah, sure. I make a motion that we uh, amend this. Oh, second. Okay, Mr. Boswell has made a motion to uh, approve the budget amendment. Mr. Lashley has seconded it. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, thank you, Sheriff. Thank you all very much. The next two we have are from DSS, and we have our director, Adrian Day, here. Good morning. Welcome. How are you doing? I'm well. How about you? Good. Good. Um, the first budget amendment I have is our community response program. And this is um, a voluntary service that we do through our child protective services. We've actually had the pleasure of having this grant a couple years um, previously. However, this year there was no formal grant process, so we didn't apply, but we received the allocation. Um, so I'm just asking for a budget amendment to approve the $100,000 for one year um, with no match from the county. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, Mr. Carter has made a motion to approve the budget amendment. Mr. Boswell has seconded it. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, then you have another one? I do. I have my second one is um, we received CARES Act fund from DHHS for foster care stipend. And this is. Um, $100 extra paid to every licensed placement provider for our children in foster care and for our youth who are 18 to 21. And this covers the months of April through September. It's $37,000 with no county match. Again, motion to approve. Second. Okay. Um, Mr. Carter has made a motion to approve and Mr. Sutton has seconded it. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <coughs> all right, thank all you right, very thank much. All right, thank you. Next are a couple of items for the health department. So if our interim health director, Alex Rimmer, would please come forward to present. All right, so I'm going to start with the one um, that's some COVID funding that we received. It's in the amount of um, $2,100,857. Um, so this is to support our infection prevention. So through case investigation, hiring of interpreters, contact tracing, and data support. Um, so in total, we've received just over $600,000 um, for COVID response. Um, and spent to date around 107,000 um, with 204 uh, mark, earmarked to December 31st. And so this will just help us with our COVID response. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, Mr. Carter has made a motion to approve and Mr. Lashley has seconded it. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, next one. All right, and our next one is going to be um, an FDA grant that we have been coming uh, before you each year for the past few years for, um, and it helps with training, um, advancing goals, small projects, and maintaining conformance uh, with our food and lodging program. Um, so this does include out-of-state travel for a required seminar through FDA um, planned for October 2021. Um, it's a 100% reimbursement grant, and there's no local match. 
So moved. Second. Okay, Mr. Lashley has made a motion to approve that, and Mr. Carter has seconded it. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Is she going to do anything on the virus today? If or? you have a question for Well, I'm not necessarily so much on the virus. Good to know the statistics are good. Um, but this morning, I think the Nobel Prize for Medicine came out uh, two Americans and one from England, I think, in regards to the, their <clears throat> history on the hepatitis C. Uh, what is the status of hepatitis C in this county as far as what's... I would have to pull percentages on that, but I can get you the information. Yeah, I'd like to know that. And, you know, if you go back far enough, uh, you know, I have a boy that's 41 and one that's 35, and I remember when they were sent home sheets from the schools about taking a hepatitis C shot. And they'd never had to have anything. Yeah, that was first year. And when you looked at the sheet, I mean, the CDC is good not to tell you cause. They tell you effects, but they don't give you cause. And, you know, to anything, there's a cause and effect. And I don't like that to start with. But bottom line is, I looked at the front of that sheet, small print, no causes, no causes, no causes, no causes. Flipped it over, no causes, no causes. And down in the midway of the back sheet, it was talking about the um, um, frequent drug use, um, personal interactions between people, to put it as nice as I know how to put it. And also immigrants coming in that aren't vaccinated or, you know, not, uh, they don't have the immunity system or whatever that we've got here. And, and now it's, uh, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty big news around the world. And here, something we didn't have in the past, as far as much of it, at least not enough to have to have a vaccine. So I would like to know what we know about it in Alamance County and, and who's vulnerable, who's being trained or caution against all the things that cause it if you don't mind yeah, yeah but that course. just happened today the nobel prize for medicine mm -hmm. came out all right yeah i'll get you that information Pretty mr sutton okay thank you thank that's you. all I well i have a question i'd like to ask too uh okay we went from basically zero to 114 which is pretty fast covid cases over in the jail and then we went from 114 to zero almost as fast as we went there we went away um I think that's an indication that the sheriff's office and the detention department over there has really been doing a yeoman's job and of the health department. mitigating that and right the health department the health nurses and contact tracing and everything else have really been doing a yeoman's job and we need to get some recognition for that for those departments appreciate it a bunch do you have any more COVID questions or anything right in a second okay thank you thank you all right, the next budget amendment is from the Board of Elections, and I think we have Kathy Holland joining us remotely. Yes, ma'am, Chair Gailey. Yes, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. I'm doing well, thank you. We're doing all right. Um, what do you have for us today? I'm coming from the Center for Tech and Civic Life. It's been offered to the state boards of elections and the county boards of elections nationwide. Many uh, counties in North Carolina have already applied for and received these grants. With the help of Andrea, I applied for mine and was uh, award. I was awarded um, one hundred and one thousand, a little over one hundred and one thousand dollars, and it is not a um, matching grant. It's um, just for the uh, purpose of COVID response. The only thing I saw, the only thing I saw that was a little um, concerning to me, and, and I uh, included for you, is it says drive through voting. Is it says drive through voting? What it funds? And North Carolina, you know, we don't have drive through voting. We have curbside voting, and the curbside is um, drive through is not accurate for North Carolina. In other words, the 
uh, actual legal term is curbside voting, and it's only for those voters who are unable to enter the polling place due to a disability. But we will use the funds for that purpose to buy additional um, signs and signage and uh, things that we will need to implement curbside voting at the uh, early voting sites and on election day. But the other things included with that are uh, PPE, hand disinfectant, uh, signage, voter education. Which we are continuing to do, and this money will will help us to implement all of those things. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, Mr. Carter has made a motion to approve that, and Mr. Lashley has seconded it. Um, do you may have any questions or comments? I saw somebody, some wit, said somewhere that for the election they should put Chick Fil A in charge of it, but. Uh, Chick-fil-A <laughs> can run a drive-through like nobody. I thought that was cute. And isn't that the truth? <laughs> Although, Kathy Holland and her team do an outstanding job. They do. We're very proud of them and, and grateful for their hard work and all that they do. Um, and Kathy, how are you doing for your uh, poll workers and your um, people to staff the election? Are you still looking for workers? Um, Chair Gailey, we have uh, had a, a number of people who have indicated they would like to work. Election day is a little bit challenging, but the early voting is the most challenging because people are not willing to work all of the days. And we have five sites, and each site has a considerable number of workers when you think in two shifts. And it's, it's really a challenge to try to manage the staffing if you don't get a, 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 a worker who's not willing to work all of the days. So we're still struggling a little bit with some of the sites and having backup in case we have a COVID outbreak. But we're working through it. We've had excellent support from HR and some programs that the state board has implemented. So we're working on it. We'll get through it. We'll, we'll do fine. If somebody is interested in um, being a poll worker for you, is it too late for them to get involved? No, it is not. We, uh, we're having people... Uh, apply every day or having quick people every back day. out every day so it is pretty much a constant flow we'll, we'll, we'll make it we'll be fine we'll make it all right well we have a motion and a second to approve the budget amendment if there's no further discussion all in favor please say aye aye, aye. anyone opposed all right thank you so much thank you everyone thank you the next everyone. item is uh related to inspections and we have uh, robert key here Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. First, I'd like to say thank you for your service to the community. It's appreciated. As regards our department, we have seen a really significant increase in activity uh, ever since the start of COVID, which is kind of ironic, but uh, we and all of the departments in the area have been quite busy. Um, our number of houses that we're doing each month, we're now averaging 55, which is about as high as we've ever been. Um, but what's on the horizon is even more significant. Um, I gave all of you uh, a list of the major commercial projects uh, that we're going to be starting or have started. Granite Mills is uh, maybe 60% finished. As soon as they finish, they'll do Tabadri, I don't think I'm pronouncing that right, Tabadri Mills, which is just kind of across the street. It's also in Haw River. Um, we're reviewing plans for a science building for Elon. We've got a storage facility we just permitted. Um, there are two um, charter schools, uh, one of which has a foundation permit, and the other one I don't know that much about yet. It's Clover Garden. Um, got a big solar farm getting ready to permit, and next year, Twin Lakes is going to have a really massive apartment complex that they're building five stories. Um, so add to that ABSS, uh, according, to, I talked to Jimmy Russell last week, and uh, besides the new high school, which is, uh, those plans are at the Department of Insurance waiting on approval. We expect that soon. Um, there's an addition at Southern, Eastern, and Western high schools, um, all pretty significant. Uh, Pleasant Grove is going to remodel, um, and 
according to Jimmy, all of that's going to permit in the spring. So that's going to create um, a level of activity that we have not seen in my tenure here, at least. Um, so we're asking to add a position um, because we feel it's reasonable and necessary to do so. We are forecasting our revenue. We're raising that um, enough to cover the position cost. But I, I feel like it's a very conservative estimate. Even at that, I feel like it will be really significantly higher than what we're forecasting. Um, I think my guess is this year we're going to be right out a million dollars. Uh, we are mostly self-supporting most years. Uh, last year was an exception. Our revenues were down just a little bit. Um, so between that and the residential, um, our original fiscal year budget was uh, for revenue was 725. We're revising it up to 815 and asking for the position that we need. Does anyone have any questions? Are we still brokering out or parlaying over to Burlington for, you know, <coughs> co working? We have a, an agreement with them to help each other out. I was over in Burlington doing an inspection last week for them. Um, we have not had to ask them for any help, but there is an interlocal agreement in place should that be necessary. The problem, we looked at that, explored that, and Burlington's at capacity already and more in the works for them. Uh, and yeah, not that I was trying to suggest yeah, no, go that right. route instead of this, but uh, right. I just wondered what the Yeah, no, that's a good okay. question. Thank you. <coughs> I'll make a motion that we approve this. Second. Okay, Mr. Um, Boswell has made a motion we approve, and Mr. Sutton has seconded it. Uh, before I call for a vote, let me just ask the county manager, do you have any concerns about um, this budget amendment? If not, just it's on the agenda. I do not. Uh, I believe... Robert's correct. Inspections will generate more revenue than we originally budgeted, and we're required to spend that those funds on inspections. So this is in, in line with law and the need that they're seeing in the community. So. Let me ask another question. You mentioned yeah. charter schools. Uh, when they build a school, private charter, do we have to know what the plans are that the state's approved and or but the, the state doesn't have to look at? And, it's a very good question. Schools that are of any size, like the additions on the high schools, we will just do all of the review for those. But when it's a brand new school and it's over a certain threshold, I think 20,000 square feet, which most schools would be, the plans go to the Department of Insurance. They have internal plan review that they do there. We also review the plans simultaneously. We do the plumbing, mechanical, electrical, accessibility, and we also, you know, they're doing kind of a life safety um, review of the plans. So we do that also, and our fire marshal uh, will also review the plans uh, for fire department access, um, FDCCs, things like that, make sure they're placed right, hydrants, flows, all of that. Because I know they, in certain levels, they require stuff that's not required in the general population or... Yeah, and even as far as our work, uh, the schools are always pretty much always level three inspections. There's three levels of inspector certificates. One is like single family dwelling, two is kind of in between, and three is you could inspect anything up to a large school, skyscraper, whatever. Um, so that is kind of where our need is because all these commercial projects are going to be level three projects. We need somebody with at least uh, plumbing and mechanical level three in order to be able to survive the next couple of years. And you said Twin Lakes is going to do a five-story <coughs> apartment building? It's gigantic. I've seen preliminary plans. Do uh, we have a five-story building in Alamance? I'm not too sure. That might be the first. The downtown, downtown bank. Big pardon? That old downtown bank building. Mm -hmm. yeah. That lab for you. Yeah, it's eight. I think it's eight. It's uh, Yeah, it's, it's shy of being a high-rise. It's 75 feet above street access makes it a high rise it's not there but um, it's the tallest apartment building that I will have seen we had a four-story uh, building go up in Elon a couple of years right. ago mm -hmm. so 
that probably brings a challenge to the Burlington Fire Department, I would imagine. I don't know if they have any ladders that will go to five stories or not. Well, they, can, they can handle the uh, bank building in downtown. That's so. true, yeah. Okay. All right, so we have a motion and a second to approve the budget amendment for inspections. If there's no further discussion, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, anyone opposed? Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate All right, it. the next item on our agenda is public speakers. And um, we had Jonathan Nelms has signed up in advance, and his name appears on the agenda. But I understand from talking with our clerk this morning that Mr. Nelms has indicated that um, he's going to take a pass today and does not request to be called anymore. So um, thank you, Mr. Nelms, if you're watching this or if you see it later. Thank you for your excellent communication with our clerk. We appreciate that. Um, so the net, we do have one person who requested to be called, and that's Stephanie Thurman. Mm -hmm. And I will try to call her now. Hello, this is Stephanie. Miss Thurman, can you hear me? Hold on a second. I, yes, hold on a second. Let me let my dogs out because they just started barking when they heard me talking. Yes, this is Stephanie. Okay. You're connected to the county commissioner's meeting. Okay, can y'all hear me okay? Yeah, hi, Miss Thurman. This is uh, Chair Gailey. I hope you're doing well today. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm ready if you're ready for me to begin. Sure, go ahead. Please start when you are okay. ready. Okay. My name is Stephanie Thurman and I live in Snow Camp. You may be aware that the Colonial Pipeline recently leaked over 275,000 gallons of gasoline in Huntersville, North Carolina. On September the 25th, the NCDEQ issued a notice of violation to Colonial for contaminating the community's groundwater. As part of the remediation, Colonial is paying to have area residents who rely on groundwater connected to a municipal water supply. As you know, Colonial's gasoline pipeline and two additional lines carrying jet fuel and diesel run right through Snow Camp and the proposed mining property. Colonial has stated in three separate letters to the state that the blasting operations could represent a threat to the integrity of their pipeline and that it is possible that operations at the mine could constitute a direct threat to public safety. Our concerns grew after the November 8, 2019 commissioners meeting when Ms. Gailey said that if a company applies for a permit and gets a groundwater study that says all the wells in the area are going to run dry, they might still qualify for the permit. Ms. Gailey continued to say that if our wells are impacted, we could use that study to pursue a private lawsuit, hold on, I lost my place, to get compensation from the company for the damage that they've done to our property. So are you suggesting that if our groundwater is contaminated by the mining operations or Colonial Pipeline, we would simply be on our own with the only option being to sue for our water rights? That just doesn't seem reasonable. Alamance County does not currently provide a municipal water supply to the unincorporated community of Snow Camp. That being the case, we would like to know what is your contingency plan for restoring water to the 6,000 residents of Snow Camp in the event that a permitted industrial activity leads to a disaster like Huntersville. In summary, I would like to know what a water supply contingency plan would look like for Snow Camp and an estimated cost, and I'm requesting that you add this discussion to your next meeting agenda. Thank you for your time and assistance. That's it. All right, All right thank you very much. <coughs> All right, is that the end of our public speakers? That is it, Madam Chair. Okay. Do we have any commissioner responses? Yeah, I'd like to say, you know, we brought out back when planning, in my opinion, did not do the job they should have done, not the people we have now. 
when all these permits, and you knew a pipeline, you should have known a pipeline was going through the property down there. Was it, in this, is it Colonial that's going through there or Plantation? Yeah. I think Colonial goes through the property now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so you got two, you got Colonial and you got Plantation. That's right. And I, I think the excuse came along uh, was that, well, it's so far away from, you know, it's not gonna cause a problem. And you know, I still don't buy that. And um, I think Colonial, did Colonial do a letter though, stating that it shouldn't be a problem? I, think I, I believe they did a letter stating that the mining operation maintained a certain level of charge and blast that they felt like it would be uh, acceptable, but there were some very specific engineering uh, and blast requirements. Is that right? right. They sent that letter to the uh, state mm -hmm. and had their engineers indicate <clears throat> the level of explosives used and uh, shouldn't present a problem. So what, what is, where are we in that process right now? Still waiting for the state to make a decision. I think it, what she brought up might be a good idea to bring that up at our next meeting. <coughs> to, uh, yeah. to hear a little bit about what's, what they have and uh, see. But I just don't believe we did our homework when it was initially investigated. This is my opinion and people involved aren't here anymore. Right. That's the sad part about it. But you know, when you sit back and you have phrases like, well, it should, but it might. I mean, there's always the other side of that comment. And, and I, I feel for the lady. I, and I like to know more about the, the, uh, the, the town she's talking about, too, as far as county and what the deal was there. In Huntersville? Yeah. Well, we had a review, a third-party attorney review of the uh, permitting process, and uh, I've talked to Mr. Albright about it a couple of times. I don't know uh, of a really good reason, and he's agreed with me as I recall, why we can't release the information from that attorney. Might make our um, constituents in the Snow Camp area feel a little bit more comfortable with, the, with at least the fact that we did, or at least our department followed the procedures. I'm, I, I agree with you though. Tim and, and uh, Eddie, I agree that the, I still feel a little concerned about the, that process going on, the blasting and whatnot down there near that pipeline. It's common sense tells you pipelines and explosions, explosions. Don't go good together. That's true. Either Fire one is not a good thing. Land <laughs> combined. All right. Well, it sounds like there's a consensus that the board would like to have the topic of the snow camp mine an update on where it is in the state process on the agenda for the next meeting, so. And, and a, a definitely an update to see where the state is with this. It has been a while since we talked about that and it would be nice to have a refresher on it. Okay, do we have any other commissioner responses? Yeah, I don't have enough response. Not from that, but uh, I'm gonna ask that Patsy Simpson from the school board Step down because of what she said about the president. She said that she wished the president would die, and I think that's that is unacceptable behavior from somebody on the school board. I'm asking her to step down and do us all a favor. I heard about it this morning on the radio. Yeah, they done her, they done her responses on Facebook. Yeah. Social media. I think it's a disgrace. Yeah, it doesn't sound good. For somebody on a board, like the school board, that don't have much to sh share for what they do, she surely should step down. Okay. Um. Well, I had a, the, um, the Alamance News and, and, and earlier in conversations with the sheriff, I was talking about the number of people from outside of Alamance County that have been involved in our in the protests that have been ongoing. And uh, I think that's something that we seriously need to look at in Alamance County. I, I'm not sure what the answer is because you can't control where people come from to protest, but uh, a large, what is it, like 30%? of the protesters have been from outside of the county that have been arrested, so we don't know what the total percentage is, but um, that's a, I think that's a problem that we're dealing with, and uh, 
Um, I, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. But. My answer is certainly not giving in to them. I promise you that. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Not here or anywhere else in this country. But mm -hmm. you should see, uh, I'm not even going to mention her name. But there's a, what's the word? I'm, uh, a key activist in, in, in the groups that we have out front and down in, <clears throat> in on her Facebook page. Because I, I, I look at it. She, her cover picture is her with encircled around her head and down at the bottom I'm not I can't say the word what she says about the police mm -hmm. and if anybody thinks it's just here and just what's in the circle down there that's right they're out of their minds yeah go to Asheville go to Raleigh go anywhere in the country where this stuff is taking place Davidson County. Uh, oh, yeah. my Lord. Yeah, Antifa is, is part of the problem. It's and, not just an idea. And a lot of them <laughs> works at Elon College or University. They ought to be ashamed of themselves to hire them. And you can put that in your paper if you got enough backbone <laughs> to do it. <laughs> Actually, I think they did it. <laughs> in this article got close anyway. Talking about <laughs> affiliations at, at Elon. Right, but um, yeah, I'm not going to get okay. into that. <laughs> yeah, let's move uh, on yeah. uh, the county manager's report, Mr. Hager. Do you have a report today? I do not. Okay, we kind of already started on commissioner comments. Um, does anybody else have a comment? I have a question uh, for health again. Uh, one more. If you took the number of citizens in the state and divided into the number of confirmed cases, now that's not the in and out. I think part of the sheriff's deal, and thank God for good action on, on everybody's part there, but it's a quick in and out anyway. <clears throat> and if you took the... Uh, state population and divided into the number of confirmed cases I think you rounded off it's, it's like 20 per 1,000 get it or confirmed unless I'm totally wrong on how I'm analyzing the numbers 20 out of 1,000 <laughs> if you look at Alamance County confirmed and divided into that the population you're 25 roughly and then, but what surprised me was Guilford, supposedly. Guilford mm -hmm. confirmed, divided into, population divided into confirmed, they were like 16 per 1,000. But you know, again, I know the president's sick, I know everybody's, you know, people that have it, they have it, they, a lot of people don't have it, obviously. And, and you got a lot of, as I've said all along, before you even started coming, a, a, a lot of quick in and out. You know, you got 4,000 go in and 30 some hundred come out after they serve their time and so forth. But uh, what would you attribute Guilford's numbers to? Just the lack of uh, verifications. Uh, and it's amazing if you look at that stat of 20, 25, 16 per 1,000. Getting it. And then you come around and say, okay, how many have it that are being treated and or still being looked at? I mean, it's, it's just so minute, it's unbelievable. Now, I'm not trying to downplay anything, but I just don't believe that we look at the stats that, and I'm not saying you at all, but what would you attribute Guilford County's low versus the state and, and us? Uh, and uh, and aren't, aren't those numbers supposedly even dropping? Or, or what are you seeing there? So overall, Alamance County's percent positivity has gone down in the past few weeks, and that was um, Brian's email right. last night. Um, I think it was 4.9 percent. And so um, Alamance as a whole has seen a trending downwards. Um, I know, for instance, in Orange County, they have a little bit stricter local rules as far as mask wearing and enforcement. Um, so that might attribute for those, their lower numbers. As far as Guilford, um, I can't speak to their specifics, but Alamance as a whole, you know, like we were talking about our nurses, they work 
very closely to contact trace and that kind of thing. And so they're able to see how widespread it is. Like if someone tests positive and then the folks around them do, um, they do a lot of work as far as um, following kind of Venn diagrams and that kind of thing to ensure that people are in quarantine or isolated when necessary. So that might be part of the um, reason our numbers are a little higher. I think our staff do a great job and they, they continue to follow really closely um, the spread and ensure that they take it to the nth degree, whatever that might be, um, in order to try to slow things down. And I think that attributes a lot to us going down to 4.9% because they're able to have these folks do the necessary things that they need to do. I expect to for those to so, so large a county. Well, they got half a million people over there roughly, I think, a little bit under that maybe. But it's a little harder to be as thorough over there as it is here, you know, and so that's probably why your numbers are more encompassing. But uh, what's your personal opinion of, of something that we hear so much about that where you only have in the state 20 per 1,000 that are confirmed? And they don't stay in there long. They stay in there. The vast majority of those are probably going in just for their quarantine and they're out. Not even being looked at when they come out. Not even having been given any medication. Very few, well, probably none <clears throat> that are let go that quick. You know, required hospitalization. I'm, again, I'm not trying to downplay this, but what does, does, does 20 per 1,000 sound alarming? Or, or does that sound normal? <laughs> Rod, I, so when you think about all the measures we've gone through as a state to try to combat COVID and slow it down, I think that's that's a lot of the reason the numbers are so low. Um, I think just from being in the case investigation room and getting to hear what the nurses talk to folks about, yes, a lot of people do go into isolation for 10 days and come back out. But there's a lot of people that have COVID relapse after they're out of isolation and are having to be hospitalized. There's a lot of information we're still trying to learn about. What what does this um, what does COVID do to you in the future? Like what kind of long-term damage does it do to your lungs and things like that? So I think there's a lot of unknowns. And I think as we've seen in our own community, um, especially 65 and older, um, the their ability to recover is a lot less than, than younger folks or immunocompromised and things like that. And so I think when we go into making the state makes these decisions on when to go to what phase or when to take away certain things or you know um, recommending mask wearing and that kind of thing it's it's more of a broad picture for the overall public so um, 10 days may seem very quick but that that's really your time that you would be um, contagious so you might not necessarily be 100 percent well on day 10 so that's going to be fever free for 24 hours and a reduction of symptoms but that doesn't mean you're not you're not going to have the relapse. That doesn't mean you're in the clear. It just means that you're no longer contagious. And so that's really important to point out because we have seen a lot of that happen. A lot of folks go into the hospital after day 10 and things like that. So there's a lot more to it than just the, the 10 day isolation period. I know I had a student that told me she had it, had had it. And I looked at her and I said, well, what were your symptoms? And she said, well, smell and taste. And uh, she just laughed and she said she stayed home and then she's back out <laughs> jumping around after her 10 days. Talked to another student whose father worked for a certain company. I won't mention the name of the company, a big company in Greensboro. And they told him, in all honesty, if you go to Myrtle Beach and you come back, we don't care if you don't have anything or any symptoms. You've got to stay home for a certain period, if you even go down there. And that was a strong comment, too. So, you know, it's, it's, it's so confusing. Thank you for what you do. I'm not trying to... Yeah. <laughs> Got a question on you. that issue of relapse. Uh, have, has there been any measurement of the age group that's going through the relapse process? Because the younger age group seems to have the lower severe symptoms. The older age group seems to have the higher severity, so the, is the relapse occurring more in the older citizens than it is in the younger, or Good have question. we even looked at it that way? Good question. We haven't really pulled that data, but it would be really interesting. Um, I know personally, um, just from things that I hear with case investigators and our nurses, there have been college-age students that have relapsed and had to go to the hospital, so I think it's more obviously more prevalent with um, 
older populations, but I don't think that it's just older populations. I know we get a daily report on the uh, case count. Might be interesting to see how many of those are relapse cases. Yeah, I can talk to Christy about that and see if there's a way to. Okay. You're actually twice. No. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm super pleased with how things have worked out with the jail. It was alarming and had a lot of questions and concerns when we first had the jail outbreak, but I've um, asked a lot of questions and been involved in the uh, jail's response to its outbreak with the virus and um, the sheriff and the health department and the detention center staff have worked very hard and well together and they have zero cases in the jail now. Is that still correct? So that is um, really good to hear. How are things going with uh, Elon University? Can you uh, give us an update about that? I asked some questions about that by email um, with you and Jeff Stein and got some good information, good feedback. Back. And Elon does have a um, dashboard up through that you can see through the school's website that has a lot of information about the virus there. What's the trend though at Elon? Are they increasing, decreasing the number of cases or staying about the same? It started decreasing some, so they're on a 14 day, what they're calling a social hiatus. And so um, there's a lot of strict rules in place for students um, to try to kind of slow their movement. They've got grab and go meals and that kind of thing. So, um, like this is showing estimated 39 active cases um, and 129 currently, and that is quarantine and isolation added together. I did verify that from the last meeting. So that's gonna be these 39 that are active plus all of their close contacts, essentially. Um, and so they've been working really hard with us. We talk to them daily um, and try to work through any kinks that we're having as far as communication and making sure students know when they need to be um, in quarantine and how long and those kind of things um, and just giving recommendations on um, trying to slow the spread. And so the, the last meeting, I can't remember how many it was, but it was, it was in the hundreds. It was pretty significant, the amount of cases. Mm -hmm. So um, they're working really, really hard to try to slow the spread and, and, and try to get their numbers down. Is that 11 employees hospitalized or just 11 employees with cases? Do we know? Um, that's just 11 um, active cases for employees. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be over the total. The only hospital, there's only been one hospitalized as a result of Elon. And those other three categories look like students. Mm -hmm. Estimated active cases and new cases. Cumulative. We know if that student is hospitalized with underlying health conditions, or is that? I'm not sure. Specific. If it's a student or an employee hospitalized, I'm not. Oh, okay. It could be an employee. Right. Um, I also had a question about you know uh, we have the continuing state of state of emergency paperwork that I've signed every five days since March <laughs> and uh, now we're in phase three of the governor's plan so I thought maybe we could have a discussion about whether or not there's a reason to continue with uh, signing the state of emergency um, what do you think I think I certainly want to touch base with Debbie and uh, Yancey and make sure there's not some thing that I'm not aware of that there's some kind of advantage for either businesses or individuals I'm not aware of any but before I tell the board it would be okay or a good idea to, to do away with the state of emergency I'd like to touch base with them. I can do that today and email you all and find out what I let you know what I hear. So and it may be something that if it's no longer beneficial, uh, you know, to, to folks in the community to do, maybe time to pull the plug on it. So yeah, Michelle Mills has got it worked out to a to an art form <laughs> with uh, electronic <laughs> signing and stuff. So it's a lot easier than it was in the beginning. But uh, if there's not a reason to continue with the state of emergency, I would like to discontinue it. Certainly. Does anybody else have anything for commissioner comments? There's a shoulder. She's feeling a lot better. <laughs> Had a rough week too. Okay. Got a good ride on though. 
That's right. You don't leave it one. <laughs> and, and, and a good foot. That's right. <laughs> Well, that'll be taken the wrong way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was thinking, actually, Mr. Sutton, I was thinking, gee, thanks for that. that. <laughs> We're not laughing at any kind of anything. We are very serious around here. Okay, uh, I move that we now go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute Section 143-318.11A3 in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the county attorney and the board and receive a report regarding the claims made in the case entitled NAACP et al. versus Graham et al. As well as I also make a motion that we now go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute Section 143-3117.11A6 to consider a personnel matter. Second. Have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. All right, if we could uh, resume session, if somebody wants to make a motion to come back uh, into open session. So moved. Second. Thank you, Mr. Lashley and Mr. Um, Carter. We have a motion and a second to return to open session from closed session. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Uh, so a statement uh, about the motion to go into closed session regarding um, the claims made in the case entitled NAACP et al. versus Graham et al. The board received a report from the county attorney concerning the case, and then we considered uh, personnel matters, and no action was taken. So, all the business of the board being concluded will be adjourned. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioners Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Graham. Typically the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on local Gov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.